Ladies and gentlemen, uh, happy Monday and uh, welcome to the first uh, side event of the Economic Symposium 2022. <clears throat> so we decided that see, since the tax reform is uh, one of the ministry's biggest initiatives, we began uh, a side event with, uh, with the tax reform. And uh, so we'll start off this morning with the Palau Goods and Services Tax. Uh, by raise of hands, uh, who has attended the previous workshops that we've had over the past mm, two months or so? Oh, okay. So really, everybody has attended. So with the uh, Palau Goods and Services Tax, PGSD, nothing Nothing really significant has changed in terms of uh, the contents and how it's applied. The only thing that I want to point out, and this is um, a result of uh, previous uh, consultations, is that if, uh, if you've attended the workshops, you might have known that the PGSD invoice, uh, that was like the hot topic of every workshop that we had especially in terms of the requirements that uh, it had. So I'll quickly run through the slides. It's nothing different. Uh, if you have questions uh, with uh, how it works as a follow-up from the last time, please raise those questions now. And then I'll go through it in maybe probably an hour. And then I'll yield it over to business profit stats where there has been uh, significant, significant developments made in terms of uh, forms and etc. So with the PGSD, we all understand the registration requirements. It's the businesses with a taxable supply of three hundred thousand. If you're FIAC, if you're an FIAC holder, uh, you are to register as well, as well as uh, PPUC, PNCC, and BSCC. If you haven't registered, the, the two ladies sitting at the table at the back, they have registration forms with them. You may register with them before you uh, leave the seminar this morning. So if you want to do so, if you need any assistance in filling out the forms, if you have any questions with the forms that you might have received in your email, feel free to ask them and they can help you while we're here. So as we mentioned, uh, PGST is a 10% tax on most goods and services consumed in the Republic, whether it's imported, manufactured, or produced locally. So if you've been in the workshops before, this is really nothing, nothing new. It's sort of the same contents. The, the same principles apply. Most goods and services supplied in the Republic have PGSD added to its price, with the exceptions of uh, goods uh, and services supplied by businesses that are not required to register, or those that we call exempt supplies. Are there any questions regarding what is said over here? Any questions that we need to clarify? This is really the time to ask Questions. This is sort of a follow up from the last time. So, if there are any questions with regards to the concepts and the principles of the way PGSD works, this is the time to ask. No? As we mentioned, PGSD is on a monthly basis. Your PGSD return is due 30 days following the end of each month. For example, your uh, PGSD return for the period of January of 2023 is due on March 2nd, 2023. If you have, um, how do you know if you pay or receive credit? If you charge more PGSD than you paid for, then you pay when you file a return. If you pay more PGSD than you charge, uh, then you receive a credit when you file a return. Is that clear with everybody? Do we understand how P 
PGSD works on imports, uh, how it's based on the CIF and not the FOB, unlike import duties. Are, are we good? That come January 1st, upon import, when you import something, you'll be charged 10% on the CIF. And if it's an excisable goods, what happens? It's the CIF and the, and the 10%. If it's excise, then it's CIF plus the excise plus the customs entry fee, all of those together, then the 10% goes in last. The same goes for hotel. If you're a hotel, it's the room rate uh, plus service fee plus hotel room and vessel occupancy tax. Uh, all of those together and then 10% PGST at the very end. Why? Because PGST is added to the final price that you give to the customer. Is that clear with everybody? Yeah. Yes. Uh, for example, we are the distributor of cigarettes. Excise tax is $50, the IF is $10, 60 times 10%, $6 and combined that. Yes. Price from the markup. Yes. It's uh, the 10% PGST is applied after the CIF value plus the excise plus the customs entry fee. You add all those together, then the 10% goes in last. The same goes if you're a hotel. It's the room rate the, plus the hotel room vessel cabin occupancy tax, the service charge, uh, and any other charges that you have, all those together then it's the 10% at the very last. I think we all, for imports, we've all seen the same examples. We all understand how it works. So we're going to go through each slide. If you have, I'll leave you a minute to each slide. And then if you have any questions regarding that, then we'll discuss. If not, then we'll move on to the next. I, I, I think for this example, it's generally the same. This is where you see how, this is specifically for carbon tax, but it's the same principle as how it applies to excise. Eh? Questions? No? Okay. Uh, same goes if you if it's a service you're a service provider, you it's uh, if you let's say for construction it's eighty thousand plus eight thousand PGSD. When you remit it's eight thousand less whatever PGSD you paid for on your expenses. Is that clear with everyone? This, as I mentioned, it's the same that goes for hotels. It's the room rate plus the hotel tax plus service charge and whatever fee that you give to your customer. And that's what the 10% the will be applied to. So like we've always said, PGSD does not impact your profits. It doesn't impact your liability for business profits tax and therefore you will not 
your whatever PGSD payable you have, those are not considered as an allowable deduction under PGSD. So types of supply of goods. Uh, what constitute as a supply of goods? There must be a transfer of ownership, right? Yes. And then so what differentiated from supply of services is there's uh, with services, there's a transfer of right in the supply of goods without the transfer of ownership title. Is that clear with everybody? Uh, supply classification, we discussed the 10% uh, and uh, as well as those supplies that are considered zero rated or where 0% uh, PGSD is applied to and then the exempt supplies. Uh, we discussed that ta taxable supply, in order, in order for it to be considered as a taxable supply, it must meet all of those four requirements. And then they're either taxable at 10% and 0%. So other than what I'm going to mention in the next two slides, uh, if it meets those four requirements and it's not stated in the next two slides, then it's all taxable at 10%. So the law really specified, as we mentioned, uh, zero rated supplies. It's all of those following goods for export, aircraft or ship stores, including fishing vessels for use or consumption outside of Palau, good, service, good supply to repair temporary imports, services connected with temporary imports, exported services, plastic pellets for water manufacturing. If you import, uh, plastic pellets uh, and you're a water manufacturer registered under excise, so then the pellets that you import are uh, zero rated. Zero rated meaning 0% uh, PGST is applied to it when you import. Uh, International transport services, this is goes for your airline tickets. Airline tickets are zero rated supplies as well. So when you purchase airline tickets, the PGST that's there is zero percent. That's for international flights. For domestic flights, it will be charged a 10% PGST. Any questions? Okay. Uh, supplies made to a medical pharmacy. Supplies meaning it's prescription drugs. So if it's not a prescription drug, then a 10% PGSD is applied to. So if I'm a medical pharmacy and I import Tylenol, that's 10% PGSD. But if I'm a medical pharmacy and I'm importing Tramadol, then that's uh, zero rated because it's prescription drugs. Uh, transfer of a business as a going concern, that's also zero, considered a zero rated supply, meaning the PGSD that's levied to it is zero percent. Except supply, as I mentioned, it's financial services only. And then uh, that includes all of those following items, loans, deposits, investments. Time of supply. Does anybody have a question with regards to time of supply? Time of supply is uh, determines when uh, a tax uh, person becomes liable to pay PGSD. This is really important during this time as we transition into the implementation period, especially for hotels who receive bookings this year, but the actual booking is gonna, or the person's gonna arrive next year. If you've invoiced the person for the stay and you've received a deposit for that stay this year, then PGSD will not apply to the particulars on those in that invoice next year. That's 
the ideal time of supply. Uh, is there any questions with regards to that matter? Yes. So I guess checks in on the 20th of December, mm -hmm. checks out the 10th of January. How would you, and we invoice on the 10th of January, how would you inform the GST on that? Would we have half GST, half not, or full GST, or all GST? I think if this is, if they pay before hand or they pay after? If they pay before and you've issued an invoice for that payment, then no PGST applies even though it takes place next year or part of the reservation takes place next year. However, if it's uh, paid after, Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I mean, for, for us in our transition, it would be really handy we just need to know that so we can right. encourage them to pay before or pay after or notify them now to make a reservation of this sort of practice. Right. on an accrual basis, uh, it's on a cash basis, uh, therefore you account for uh, the input and output taxes when they are paid or received. Okay, invoices, documentation, and record keeping. The only real changes that was made, uh, and this was uh, as a result of the, of the, some of the concerns and the views that were raised during workshops and earlier consultations with taxpayers. We've moved to remove the name and address and the, we've moved to remove the pin of the recipient. So the only thing that's required now is the name and address of the recipient including all of the, including all of those items. I don't want to see. So it's words the uh, PGST invoice in a prominent place. It's the name, address, and tin of the supplier. The name, address of the recipient. Uh, there's no tin requirement anymore. And the individualized serial number and the date on which the PGST invoice is issued. Description of the goods supplied or services supplied and the date on which the supply was made and the price of the supply and the amount of PGST charge. So really the only really the, the only changes were the removal of the thing of the recipient. You still need to take in their name and address. Yeah. What's that? Oh. So the address you want a full your bus address or can you just say another email? Uh, I think that, uh, uh, an address of where the business location is is fine. Not not the postal address. You see, yeah. So, so it's Porter. I understand that uh, all these fourteen goods is not carry PGST, right? So I wouldn't have to make any changes on my invoices that are listed to be exported. Yes. Well, I would need a different one when it happens. Domestically, yes. So with the removal of the pin of the recipient, that is really what it looks like now. It still somehow looks the same, but it only asks for the name and address of the purchaser or the recipient of the supply. Just a reminder, uh, the PGST invoice is really important because if you don't get the invoice, you don't receive a credit. Uh, one of the things that uh, 
I would like to reiterate in the first uh, bullet item is that as the if you're the supplier of the goods or service, it is not your responsibility to ask if they're PGSD registered. It's really on their on the on the recipients and to ask for one. It, it's good if you ask them if you're PGSD registered or not, but it's not the your responsibility to ask for them. It's their if they want the credit, they need to ask for one. Is that clear? And then all of the all of the information. The record keeping, remember, um, tax records must be kept for at least uh, three years. We are looking to move that up to five years. So please um, make sure you keep all your records. And that applies to the date of the transaction to which PGSD relates to. This one is really, really important that you really need to take note of. If you haven't started doing so, please do so. You must do a stock take on inventory on hand from September to December of 2022. And this is very important because you receive input tax credit on imports. The credit is based on the 3% import duty that you paid for. It's not we're not crediting you based on the excise. It's specifically only the 3% import duty that you pay for. We're not crediting the excise. Questions? No questions? Okay. And that's how the return form looked like. I think we went through this in the previous workshop, so I'm not, I'm not gonna dive deep into it. What I'm gonna leave you guys with uh, is just look at the form, look at the way the calculations go, and if you have any questions, this is the time to ask. And the return form is not done by business license, as we've reiterated before. It's at the taxpayer level. So if it's a corporation, you will fill out uh, this one return form for all the businesses under that corporation. Same goes for sole proprietor. Yes. So we just followed whatever that was on the RPPL. It's, it's policy discussions that I can't comment on. If 
if you if you if you believe that uh, putting it into quarterly filing is what's uh, best, then feel free to write to us. There are room, uh, rooms for amendments and uh, to be made within the next year. That's and if the Congress agrees with that. So if that's what you think is best, please write to us and we'll make sure to put it in with a list of amendments, yes. Input tax credit, input tax is whatever PGSD you purchased or received. The, that's on the second portion of the PGSD return form. If you have any questions, let me know. It's calculated and we can explain and dive deep further into it. Any questions? Yes. What is the line M? Total purchases of business capital assets including bonds. A box I. So, uh, in box, uh, in the line, uh, in the portion where it discussed business capital assets, uh, we, all, we ask you to uh, provide the amount excluding PGSD for statistical um, purposes. But if you see in line L, it says total sales of business capital assets. We understand that if it's sales, it, it was included in um, box D, which is your business outputs, which is the supplies that you sold. But we just need the... Um, the form asks for the amount that's excluding PGSD, specifically on capital assets. Box A and box I, which sheet are you referring to? Box B, box I. But, okay. We have this box B and box I. So, if you look at this part, uh, which is line L, ah. it's total sales of business capital assets. So if it sells, it's in, it's part of your um, business outputs because it's the supply that you sold because it's a sale. But we just ask for the amount that ex excludes PGSD. It's the same that goes for line M, which is the total purchases of business capital assets. We understand that if you purchase capital assets, it was included here in your uh, business inputs uh, where you purchase supplies. So, but for statistical purposes, we just ask for the amount excluding PGSD, specifically on business cap capital assets alone. Was that clear? Okay, so uh, line item L, which is the total sales of business capital assets meaning you sold the capital assets, right? So when you, when you sell something, and it's included in your outputs, right? Because you sold it with 10% PGSD or 0% PGSD, one or the other. So because you sold the capital assets, it was captured on your business, cap uh, business outputs, which is the total of the supplies you sold or provided. Right, but but for this specific line item, which is the business capital assets portion line item L, it just asks for the amount excluding PGSD. So if I sold, let's say I'm a construction and I sold a backhoe for sixty thousand, it's six thousand plus uh, six thousand PGSD. So I know if I sold it. The six, the sixty thousand was included here, and the six thousand is included in column two because that's the amount of PGSD. What this portion asks is just the sixty thousand amount. That that's under assumption that it's been included 
in the business uh, outputs? Because those are the supplies that you saw. So if you sold something, generally it's here, right? But if you sold a capital asset, we just ask you to disclose it here. So it's added here, and you will disclose the amount here, basically. It's the same that goes if you purchased business in a capital asset. So if I imported the back hole for 60000 I paid uh, 60000 for it, plus 6000 GST, PGST. So I'll disclose the 6000 here. It's the amount excluding PGSD. Okay, understand. However, in this sheet, 60,000 is from where? It's from this one. Uh, this one. Okay, That's a whole import. That will be the asset, therefore, I put yes. 60,000 without GSD. The, without GSD, PGSD. Okay. So yeah. if you look at all the green color, the green column is the amount excluding PGSD, and the blue column is the amount, the amount of PGSD, and really it's the blue columns that you use to calculate the bottom portion. Yeah. Good? Okay. No problem. This is the time to ask. So please uh, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Clear? Okay. So, as we mentioned before, uh, calculating net PGST payable or creditable. Line item N is uh, 22,400. It's that amount in column two. Uh, line item A, column two, which is the 22,400. If, <clears throat> obviously, if you use the XE file, the, the file, the, the application in the USB, I believe it will, it will be able to calculate this part, so you won't manually calculate it. You just put in the numbers and it will calculate it for you. But it's always better to understand the logic of how it works. Eh? So if it's 22,400, that's the amount that you collected from your customer. That's line item N. Line, line item O is the amount of PGSP you purchased or received. That's on your expenses and whatever business related expenses you have that you paid PGSP for. So this time it's 82650 Remember when we said that uh, when input tax credit uh, is uh, greater than the, the output tax, which is the amount that you receive from your customer, it signifies that you will receive a credit, right? Uh, so what happens when it's the other way around? You're gonna pay the difference, right? Uh, okay. So that's the general idea and principle behind the form and how PGSD works. So if you have any questions at this time, please feel free to ask. We have a short uh, exercise after this that will cover what has been mentioned. It's not a test, uh, I'm not gonna grade you, we just wanna know uh, how everybody's understanding what we're relaying and what we can do more to um, make everybody understand uh, PGSD and what we, how we can improve in our communications as well. Special issues and circumstances. Nothing has really changed in this portion. However, if you've attended the previous workshops, you probably heard of the employee fringe benefits, right? In the, the regulations that have been proposed, then we've got an indication that it will go through. Uh, employee fringe benefits was uh, removed. Yeah, 
Yeah, so employee French benefit is not a taxable supply. Yeah. <laughs> we propose for it to be, and then uh, we really thank you. That's why we always say that please share your views, your comments uh, in regards to the regulation. Please take time to read them, formally write to us. Is that through those comments and views, we are able to really capture what our taxpayers feel and we're able to address them accordingly. Some we can, some are somehow limited. We have limited powers in doing so, but we were able to get the employee fringe benefits removed along with the thing requirement. So all of these things are, they're generally the same. Any person with a question with regards to contracts? And if you've issued invoices or no? No question? So basically, let me sum this up in one example. Let's say I'm a contractor and uh, my, I've entered into a contract with a customer uh, and I've invoiced them for 80000 this year for the entire project. Then there's no PGSD charge even though the services are rendered next year. However, if the contract is uh, uh, for 80000 but when I invoice, uh, uh, I invoice them by installments uh, or by milestones. Uh, then it's not a then if it's rendered next year, then PGSD applies. So if uh, the project is eighty thousand, and when I do a landfill in this person's home, I I I bill them ten thousand that takes place this year. So there's no PGSD. However, if phase two of the project, I put up the foundation. Then if I put up the foundation and that takes place next year and I invoice them next year, then PGSD applies. So if you issue one invoice for the whole project this year, that's, it's, um, there's no PGSD. But if you do it by installments, so, or by milestone, or by progress, then PGSD applies if the services are rendered next year. So landfill this year, no PGSD. Foundation next year, there's PGSD. Put on, um, I don't know, a roof, I don't know. PGSD applies. <laughs> Any questions? Questions? Agents, uh, commission. Uh, this applies to agency agreements. Uh, uh, this is mainly when a uh, supply is made by a person acting as an agent for another person. The other person, being the principal or the customer, is treated as a supply made to the principal. Commissions made to the agent is considered as a taxable supply, and therefore PGST is charged by the agent to the principal. That's an if the agent is PGSD registered. Who issues the tax invoice? If the, P, if the agent is PGSD registered, then the agent issues the tax invoice to the customer on behalf of the principal. 
You might have seen this example before in our previous workshop. So it's the same same goes. If Robert sells the hotel room for 181.50 through an agent for 181.50, the agent sells the room to the customer for 181.50, remits back to Robert, the, and then invoices Robert for dollars plus six dollars uh, PGSD and commission. That's an if the agent is PGSD registered. We understand that this is the most basic way that agency agreements work. If you have different agreements with your agents, please see us after, unless you want to discuss those agreements with everyone. This sort of uh, same principle applies if you're selling um, let's say you're a store and you're selling someone's um, bento or magi. So if you're selling someone's bento or magi, because you're serving as the agent the, on behalf of the principal, you'll have to somehow turn off the PGSD that's charged to that bento. Because the principal is not PGSD registered, and therefore you can't charge the 10% PGSD to the customer. However, if your arrangement is you buy the person's bento and then you unsell it, then you can charge the 10% PGSD. Any questions? So, online travel agencies, because they sell it on your behalf, they'll have to charge you PGSD. They'll, they'll charge PGSD to the customer, but they won't charge you a PGSD on their commission. That's until they register. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Any questions with regards to agency agreements? No? Okay. So as we always say, there's no input uh, tax credit for, purpose, uh, for purchases used to provide entertainment. Entertaining me, uh, entertainment means the provision of food, beverages, tobacco, amusement, recreation, or hospitality of any kind, unless, unless one of the following applies. The entertainment is provided in the ordinary course of the business carried on by the person to provide the entertainment, and the entertainment is not supplied to an associate or employee. Therefore, if uh, I own a restaurant, then it is very normal for me to provide um, uh, food and beverages and recreation, and those are part of my uh, normal course of business, so that's okay. However, that's until I hold a employee staff party, all the expenses pertaining to that uh, employee party, what not, is not claimable. Or the PGSD is not claimable. Here. Yeah. And uh, the other requirement would be if the entertainment is uh, provided while the recipient of the entertainment is away from home for the purposes of the business of the recipient or the recipient's employer. These are mainly in terms of travel allowances and um, let's say 
I have an employee who goes to work at, let's say, maybe Pelenu, and then they charge 10% PGST on the hotel for my employee, then I can claim those credits because it was a business, business trip that he used um, expenses for. Disbursements. Uh, uh, disbursements are, as we've mentioned, it's anything that's purchased on behalf of the principal that can be excluded from your calculation of PGST. It has to meet all of the said requirements in order for it to be excluded from your PGST calculation. Examples of disbursements, as I've mentioned before, if you're a hotel, if you're preparing a, um, you're arranging for a tour service to the Rock Islands for your guests, then if you go pay the $50, um, $50 Rock Island fee at the Order of State, that's, uh, exempt, that's excluded from your PGST calculation. However, once you, add, once you add, let's say, a $50, it's the $50 Rock Island fee, and you added a $5, I don't know, service charge or whatnot, then it's no longer excluded from your PGST calculation and it has to go, it has to be calculated as well. That also goes for if you're in construction and you're assisting your client by arranging uh, for um, an EQPB permit, uh, that uh, process of acquiring the EQPB permit, the fee that you pay on behalf of your client, can be excluded from your PGST calculation. However, you you won't tap, you won't add in any of your own costs to that fee. So if it's a hundred fifty dollar fee from EQPB, then it has to remain a hundred fifty dollars. Once you add uh, maybe like a fifty dollar fee to make a fifty dollar service fee to that, then it can no longer be excluded from your calculation and it has to go in. And it has to be a line item. Um, it has to be itemized in your PGST invoice that it's uh, separate to your own costs. Any questions with regards to disbursements? This also occurs if you if you don't have a laundry service and your customer chooses to do his or her laundry elsewhere and you're gonna take care of that on their behalf. If it's the five dollar if it's the five dollar laundry fee, then it has to remain five dollars. Once you add in five dollars to a service charge for you then it's no longer excluded. Then it has to go in. Questions? Okay. As I mentioned, the, the two ladies at the back, please wave. They have registration forms uh, with them at the back. If you have any questions with regards to registration, please ask them and they can assist you. You can take one of the forms that they have and bring them to back to work to fill it out. Uh, and then before we break and transition into the business profits tax, uh, I'll ask them if they can help me distribute the the sort of paper that I discussed with you earlier, like a review. And then we're all, we're all gonna fill it together. It's not a test, uh, but we just wanna know if we've grasped enough and uh, where can we follow up the next time kind of situation, yeah. So if you could kindly disseminate, I believe we had enough for 30, so you might have to share in some tables.
if you have questions with the way the questions were written or uh, there's no clear direction, please raise your hands and we can address those. You can talk to each other and ask for ask for answers and help each other out. <laughs> wrong so <laughs> that just could be wrong so please point it out if you think it's wrong and then we can discuss it so Because CIF. 
Number four, the ROP national government uh, will not be paid PGST on its purchases. True or false? Huh? Oh. So the answer is false. Uh, the ROP national government will pay PGST although it's exempt from registering for PGST it will pay PGST like any other consumer would. Is that clear with everybody? Can a not PGST registered person uh, charge PGST and claim credits on their expenses? False? True or false? False. Maybe we're ready to implement today. <laughs> uh, uh, item 6. So everyone will pay PGST regardless, including private citizens and PGST registered businesses. True. Uh, PGST supplies. What must happen for it to be considered as a supply of goods? Transfer of ownership. Well, I already gave away the answer, so... So, uh, PGST will be added to the final price given to the uh, consumer for a supply of financial services. Supply of financial services. False? Why? Except supply. Very good. That's why I say maybe we implement today. I think we're ready. Uh, most goods and services supplied in the Republic will have PGST added to its final price. True. That's item number four. If Mary brought bought a blue pen from a retail store, is it a supply of goods or a supply of service? Supply of goods. Supply of goods, why? Okay, see? What if he, what if she purchased the hotel room? Services. Dispose the rate of the PGSD applied to each of the following scenario. Hotel room sold to a customer. 10%. What about airline ticket? 0%. What about uh, if I imported the uh, Vienna sausages? 10%. 10 percent. On the on the what? On the CIF. Very good. Um, if I purchased uh, clothes online for personal use, but it was delivered by mail. And it has a value of $398. Will there be PGSD? No. Why? Yeah, very good. Wow. Uh, what if, uh, uh, what if uh, Mr. Brown Construction is PGSD registers, uh, registered and builds a house for a customer? 10%. What about if I Export to na zero, zero rated PGST invoice. Can you issue PGST invoice to anyone? No, false. False. No. Why? No. Because I'm part of the PGST Right, and you can only issue to PGST. Okay. Can PGST credits be claimed if you have the invoice? True. Yes. Yeah. True. Can I ask a question? Yes. The first one there, PGST issue, invoices can be issued to a non PGST registered person. If I've got a guest stay in a hotel place for one night, mm -hmm. I've got to charge shares to admit, but then I would just, is that, I would just read that totally wrong. Okay. 
So normally for businesses that are PGSD registered or PGSD registered person, they'll ask for what's called a PGSD invoice so that they can use it to claim their credits. So you'll have a different invoicing template for your regular customer versus your PGSD registered customer in the case they ask for one. Yes. Oh. yes. It goes back to the. Mm -hmm. Goes back to what I brought up the last time. Right. It's going to be very difficult for us to have two systems to say you're PGSD on right. that line, you're not PGSD on this line. So if, if this is what you're saying, then that means you're going to be not compliant because. I'd rather have everybody sit and have a PGSD invoice whether they need it or not, than not have it if they need it. Right. So then, my question goes back again. So you're saying this, so what does that make us, are we not on Are we, or you expect us to have another concurrent system that says, you're PGSD, you go this line, you're not PGSD, you go that line? Uh, I mean, for me, the solution is everybody gets a PGST invoice. I mean, if you are registered, you can claim. If you are not registered, it doesn't matter. Yeah, because we have one the standard profile for invoice. But for business, I mean, it's usually one invoice. And if you're registered, you can claim that you're not registered. Uh, to comment on that. I know their policy discussions and he can comment on it. I know there's some degree of risk if we issue that same invoicing system because other, if I'm a regular person then I can give it to a PGSD registered person to claim the credits, but I'll leave it up to him to answer. Okay, you're 
Because sometimes I can buy, I can have a small mom and pop store up right. I can buy stuff for that small, on my name. I can go purchase stuff for that mom and pop store. But at the same time, I can purchase stuff for my own personal use. We encourage people to say, to separate those two. So they can. But how am I going to say, or how do you expect me to say, you expect me to have two different systems? Because one invoice is going to come out. Right. And that one invoice is going to say the same thing for everybody. I cannot have two separate systems for PGST and non PGST. And this is what I've been bringing up since day one. And we're back at the same thing again. Can I, can I give you a solution? So, in terms, for somebody to be able to claim a GST invoice, it's got to have their name and address on it. So, if I go to your checkout and I pay cash, it's going to say cash sale. Yes. So, that can't be claimed. So, right. if I give that to somebody else to claim, then they get audited, then they should be penalised severely for not having a correct tax invoice, claimable tax invoice. Mm -hmm. The pro forma of your invoice, this is not sure if this, this implies to me, but the pro forma, forma of the invoice at your front there, at your counter at our front desk. Well, we've got all the names and addresses of all of our guests for obvious reasons. So if they're not registered, they can't claim. If they are registered, they can claim. If they're trying to claim a tax invoice with a different name on it, they're not compliant, they should be penalised. In your case, if it's a tax invoice and they're trying to claim it that says cash sale, that's unacceptable under the rules at the moment. So uh, that's just a some suggestion if we can make it simple, particularly for these guys. I mean, for us, every tax invoice is going to name an address on it. But again, we don't want to be able to issue two separate invoices. And we put a rubber stamp on it, that's a, that's a short term solution. But I think the better solution for the business community is if we have one tax invoice that says cash sale, we can't claim it, it's got the customer name and the address on it, and then it marries off with their, with their business registration. That's, that's how you capture that. I know you're under me too. In terms of compliance and tax, I'm just, you know, just trying to find a solution that, that helps both parties. You know, I know what you're saying in terms of cash sales. That's the feedback. Totally know that. And uh, I, know, I know it's been raised several times before in terms of the complexity. So we'll take a look at it one more time. We still have a window in possible uh, proposal to change the regulations with regards to the invoice. So we will look at that and we will talk to our higher ups in regards to that. And uh, please make um, what we really ask for is please make any written written comments in if it's uh, if it's possible so we have some sort of uh, back up to what we're trying to reiterate. Yes. I sort of understand Mana's concern yeah. because uh, we of course want uh, the small businesses up north to like buy from the wholesalers. And so mm -hmm. how do we uh, help them to tell the truth? Like I'm. I'm purchasing this as a business, I'm not purchasing this as a personal. And then they bring it to a home toy and start sending it in the store. Mm -hmm. uh, there must be a way that they can prove with their business license or something. Mm -hmm. Maybe they need to show their business license, uh, even though they're not PGST registered, to show it to the wholesalers, mm -hmm. like around Hugs and Sons or Zombies and PT, and say, I'm buying this for business. It's totally uh, noted, totally noted as well. Thank you. Um, yes. I, I think the burden is put in, is being put on us, the retailers, right. to do what the auditor should be doing. If you have a small mom and pop store, and you go auditor and and they only provide you invoices of $500 or $1,000, yet your GRT or your sales is more than that. Right. Obviously, that's a red flag. So I feel like the burden is put, being put on us, the retailers, to do their job to, right. so that they don't have to go and check. That's what it seems like. 
And I don't think that's fair. Right. It's uh, very well understandable. And uh, it's um, still in red. We'll for sure address them as soon as we get out of this uh, workshop. And we'll see uh, how best we can figure out a suitable and uh, realistic solution for everyone. Yes? Everybody in agreement say yes. Okay. 
So that is what's output tax? The one you collect from your customer? Okay. Is it true that you will receive a transitional input tax credit next year on your first return? True? It's based on the what? Import duty. What about excise? No? Okay. Uh, When you file your monthly PGST return, if the amount of PGST you collected from your customer is greater than the PGST you paid for in expenses, what happens? You will pay? Okay. What happens if that's the opposite? Then you receive your credit. How many... PGST are due, PGST returns are due on the how many days? 30 days. When can you apply for a refund of your PGST credits? Two months. What happens if after two months you don't apply for the refund? It will be carried forward for 12 months. And what happens after the 12 months? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Please make more donations. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> Registration. When is the last date to register for PGST for all compulsory applicants? December 31st. But we don't have to wait till December 31st, right? Uh, we can register now. You can simultaneously register and renew your business license uh, so you don't have to come to the tax office again and again. And then the, the two ladies who waved their hands earlier, they have the application form so you can see them and they can assist you in filling out the form. Uh, Is a bond required to register for PGST? That's the second, the next question. No? False? Yes, because FIC holder. So if you're an FIAC uh, certificate holder, you need to register regardless if you meet the $300,000 threshold. How is our uh, PGST registration treated? Is it treated by taxpayer or is it treated by business license? Uh, taxpayer meaning? Meaning if it's a corporation, it's all the businesses under the corporation, right? Uh, true or false? False? So if it's a corporation, if it's a corporation and there's multiple businesses under it, are you registering it by each businesses or are you registering as one? One. one. See? Very good. So if you haven't registered, please register now. If you have any questions, this I guess will be the end of my presentation. We'll take a two minute break and then We'll discuss business profit stats, which has some significant developments in terms of forms and etc. So again, uh, good morning. Uh, run around. Uh, if you are unable to 
uh, sign up, then we'll be at the uh, yeah, so please uh, sign up before you leave. So for uh, table of contents, I will mean, first go over who will be affected from the business profits tax and how they be affected, how the business profits tax, or so you can see, uh, differs from the gross revenue tax system. I then go on to discuss how to calculate net income and its subsequent components in the gross revenue and allowable deductions. Uh, after, after that, I will go over the administration of the business profits tax and then close it uh, with other notes that I may have missed. Please uh, feel free to stop me anytime if you have any questions. So first, uh, who will be affected from the business profits tax? It's the BGSD registered persons, uh, whether you're comp uh, compulsory or you registered voluntary. I believe you've been briefed on the requirements of, uh, to be BGSD registered as well as if you elect to be BGSD registered. How will those BGSD registered persons be affected? They will be assessed and levied a BPT on their net income at the same rate as the highest rate of tax on wages and salary in the RPP at 11 plus 11, that is 12%. And again, we're going, it's the BGSD registered persons. We're moving, or we're putting less emphasis on really the business license. Level will, will, again, for one taxpayer, one form. <laughs> so for non pgs registered persons, again, for non pgs registered persons, if your taxable supply is below 50,000, I mean, it's between 50,000 uh, US dollars and 300,000 dollars, that person can either choose to remain in the gross revenue tax system and have uh, be taxed at 4% on its gross revenue uh, or after voluntary re registering for BGST, be in for the business profits tax and have their net income taxed at 12%. If your taxable supply is below $50,000, that person can pay $25 quarterly installments, $100 uh, total in a year, and that is in addition to the $25 business license fee payable uh, at the beginning of the tax year. Before getting to the technicalities of the BBT, I think it would be fair to compare it with the gross revenue tax system. So, accounting method for the business profits tax by default is accrual basis of accounting. You can continue to use cash basis uh, which was uh, the system used for, in GRT, but it will need approval by the director. The rate uh, in BPT is much higher, 12% compared to GRT's 4%. However, the base is much lower in net income uh, in contrast to gross revenue. Some perks of the BPT include that more expense deductions are allowed, and you can carry forward uh, net losses up to four years both of which were not the case in GRT. Filing dates of the business profits tax is annually compared to GRT's quarterly. However, the payment dates uh, for BPT is quarterly by prepaid installments compared to GRT's quarterly. If uh, you are familiar with uh, the US corporate tax system, this is basically how or this basically reflects on the nearest tax system. Carry forward losses only like post years to not three years to losses. It's the carry forward, it's the, yeah, the net losses. So, how to calculate net income, it's basically gross revenue less allowable deductions. I will go over both components in much further detail in the later slides. So first being for gross revenue, 
we have attended the previous workshops, this uh, will still remain the same. So, the right from businesses sourced in the Republic, uh, for example, from the exchange of goods and services, I will go over that in the next slide. Gains on disposal of uh, business assets, that's one consideration of the price, uh, asset or the price sold exceeds the net book value of the asset. The net book value of uh, depreciable assets are subjected to depreciation rates, which I will discuss later. Interest dividends, royalties, rentals, and fees, uh, they are included in your gross revenue. However, dividends from resident entities are not included as they are exempt income. Uh, again, this is for the BPT system. If you elect to remain in the GRT, then we need that uh, dividends from resident entities, they may be included in your gross revenue. So, uh, from a resident entity? Yeah, that's a good example. Uh, resident entities are, again, the locally operated companies. If a uh, taxpayer derives uh, interest or dividends from those local companies, they would not be included in the gross revenue. Again, this is for BPT. If you're in GRT or other system, then it may still be taxed. It may still be included in gross revenue as they may have different uh, meanings for gross revenue. Mm -hmm. So sources in the Republic, if you are a resident of the Republic, meaning that uh, your company is locally incorporated, and there may be rules to being a resident of the Republic, gross revenue is derived from sources in the Republic, except to the extent it can be attributable to a permanent establishment outside of the Republic. So, for example, if a uh, BGSD registered person has a, a savings account overseas and derives interest uh, revenue overseas, that interest revenue can be included in his, her, its, or their gross revenue unless it can be attributable to a permanent establishment outside of the public. So if a uh, resident person has a subsidiary outside of the public, um, that cross revenue derived from that subsidiary, if it has a permanent establishment, is not taxed in the public as it is sourced outside. So for non-residents of the Republic, gross revenue is derived from sources if it is derived through a permanent establishment in the Republic. Again, in the, uh, through a permanent establishment in the Republic. An example for that is if a foreign-based retailer had a permanent establishment in the Republic, only its income derived from such permanent establishment is sourced in the Republic. Permanent establishment is defined in the Act as a fixed place of business uh, by which uh, the taxpayer carries on a business. And before I get to the other aspects of the presentation, I understand that some of you, or most of you have uh, attended the workshops, or so you want to ask some questions before I get to the other items. So, for those of you that attended the previous workshop, what is the default accounting method for the business profit tax? Pro uh, basis, basis, cash. Pro basis, receive payment to deliver, provide a good, uh, or provide a service in the Basis in year two. I will go over the rules for revenue recognition in the following slides. 
to revenue recognition for tax purposes. In this slide, I show you what is explicitly stated in the RPPL 11-11. So income will be derived. So for a taxpayer accounting for BPT on a cash basis, it is what you should see. For a taxpayer accounting for BPT uh, on an accrual basis, it is what it is receivable. And again, accrual basis is the default method. Uh, as we are tasked to adhere with U.S. generally accepted accounting principles or U.S. GAAP. For the other taxes for the international transportation tax, it is when it is receivable. For non-resident tax, it is when it is received. All taxes they will uh, be gone over in the other taxes presentation. So revenue recognition under accrual basis uh, under US GAAP ASC 606. This is the five step of revenue recognition model. The main steps here are in uh, step two and step five. In step two, you identify the performance obligations or promises in the contract. And in step five is recognizing revenue when or as the reporting organization satisfies a performance obligation. I will go over some technical examples in the next few slides. Hopefully, after I have gone through the examples, we get uh, the concept. So the questions that we can derive from the previous slide is, what if payments for goods, services is made earlier from the satisfaction of performance obligations? And in accounting terms, the sales transaction is also known as deferred revenue. In this case, payment, uh, when you receive it, is not included in gross revenue until performance obligations are met or fulfilled. An example of this is, you receive payment for an order next year, um, you will not include that payment in your gross review until next year when you actually provide the good or deliver the service. Another question is what if payment for goods or services is made after the fulfillment of performance obligations? In terms of this sales transaction, is also known as crude revenue. And if you guys are good accountants, it can also be very related to your receivables. And in this case, because you fulfill the performance obligation, you provide the good or deliver the service, the amount is included in gross revenue, although payment has not been received. There will be rules to for bad debts or the receivables that have been deemed irrecoverable that I will discuss in the deduction slide. Okay, so example of deferred revenue. Say on November 15, 2023, family A books and makes a payment for a res reservation for a stay at Hotel B on March 22, 2024. When should Hotel B recognize gross revenue? Is it on 2023, uh, November 15, 2023, or March 22, 2024? Sales are recognized on each respective day during the stay. Therefore, for sales in December 2023, 
we have invested in 2023 sports revenue for sales in January 2024. We report that in 2024 sports revenue. This is in contrast to the GRT system, where the full payment, given that it was made on November 15, 2023, would be taxed for 2023. So going on to accrued revenue, on December 28, 2023, Family A rents a room or hotel B on credit, payable within 30 days. The hotel B receives payment on January 7, 2024. When should hotel B recognize gross revenue? Example can be applicable to other industries or other businesses. So, for example, for retail businesses, if you uh, make a sale of goods on credit, you will recognize cost review on that day, on that period, even though you've not received payment. That's a good revenue. Another uh, discussion on, or another item including gross revenue is long term contracts. This is specified in the BBT regulations. Long term contracts can be defined as a construction of engineering contract exceeding 12 months. Uh, the method of accounting for long term contracts is based on a percentage of completion method that is allowable under ASC 605 of US GAAP. The formula for the percentage of completion is the following cost incurred. Divide that to the, to the, by the total estimated cost. Get that ratio and times it by the contract revenue. Hopefully I'll go over an example in the next slide. Uh, so you guys can get an idea. And in this event, only in this event, a carry back uh, provision is allowable. As I said, uh, based in the, in the RPPL 11 less 11 allowed carry forward losses up to four years. However, in this case, the carry back is also allowable if uh, the taxpayer meets the following uh, conditions, and that is there is a loss that can also be carried forward, and the business is unable to do so because it ceases business operations. Uh, in the Republic at the end of the contract. So the example of the long-term contract uh, discussion is uh, assuming that construction company A is awarded a one million contract for three years, total estimated cost are $600,000. Actual incurred cost for each respective year are following for year one 240,000 for year two 120,000 for year three 240,000 how the construction company will account for revenue again it can, can be found in column three based on the calculation from column two this is based uh, on a favorable approach to estimate cost estimation understand that Understand that sometimes costs can exceed uh, uh, estimated actual cost can exceed the uh, total estimated cost, especially with regards to construction or engineering uh, industry. Uh, moving on to exempt income, these items are excluded from gross revenue. Uh, 
based on the section 1433 of the Act. So the first one is the distribution by a resident entity. Again, it's an example of that is dividends from local companies. The income of a non-profit corporation that is a resident, the amount to the extent exempt from tax under chapter, that should be chapter 8 of Title 28. On chapter 9 of Title 28 on an international agreement, an amount directed by a non-resident for the operation of a ship or aircraft if the director is satisfied that the equivalent exemption is provided by which the, by the country in which the non-resident resides, an amount directed by the national or state government or a political subdivision of the board. The second line item is again is the income of a non-profit corporation that is a resident. This uh, line item would uh, exclude the, in the income of a non-profit should it register for PGSD have income. This would exclude uh, the recognition of the income of that of those non-profit corporations. There will, there will be rules to non-profit corporations that we will hopefully. Uh, provide at least by the end of the year. Any questions before I move on to the deductions? Moving on to allowable uh, deductions. Before I get to the general list of allowable uh, deductions, I want to provide the general principles of deduct for expenses to be deductible. So, unless provided in the law, deduction is allowed for expenditures or losses to the extent incurred by a person deriving amounts included in gross revenue to qualify for a deduction, there must be a sufficient connection between the expenditure or loss and the derivation of amounts included in gross revenue so that it can be said that the expenditure or loss was incurred in deriving amounts included in gross revenue. The expenditure or loss incurred for a purpose other than deriving gross revenue is not allowed as a deduction. Examples of that is an amount incurred uh, in deriving exempt income, an amount uh, incurred in deriving the not for income for income that is subjected to the non resident withholding tax or the international transportation tax, as these amounts are not included in gross revenue. Again, all taxes are new taxes, uh, they will be presented in the other taxes presentation after the business profits tax. And uh, also, there will be no deduction for an expenditure or loss incurred in deriving gross revenue for a private purpose, as these are personal consumption concepts not related to the derivation of gross revenue. How you actually account for expenses in a cruel basis of accounting, expenses are recognized when they are incurred. The matching principle calls for expenses to be recorded in the same period as the revenues to which they relate. Again, it does not matter when the expenses are paid. Cash basis, in contrast, cash basis accounting, expenses are recognized when they are paid. It does not matter when expenses are actually incurred. So moving on to the list of the general list of allowable deductions, there may be more than this if you can actually relate the expenses to the derivation of gross revenue. So the first is uh, salaries, bonuses, or other compensation for personal services provided by the employees. Uh, in the BPT system, 
there was no discussion whether the $5,000 limit uh, on deduction of uh, non-resident wages would continue. So for those companies that will be in PGST and BPT, um, you can deduct all gross salaries of your employees unless there will be amendment to the act. Uh, the, however, there will be special deductions for salaries, training expenses, uh, etc. of certain plan citizens. I will go over this much further in the later slide. Employee benefit programs, so, uh, an example of that is the employer's contribution to Social Security, MSA, etc. They are uh, deductible. Rent and lease costs, ordinary operating expenses such as supplies, utility services, motor vehicles, fuel and insurance premiums other than for life insurance. The motor vehicles in this case is, is not uh, referred to the acquisition cost of the motor vehicles, it's really operating cost of the motor vehicles as well as any depreciable assets. The actual motor vehicle or any depreciable assets, they'll be amortized uh, as depreciation uh, and then we allow and that depreciation uh, amount is allowed as a deduction. Interest and royalties paid, however, there will be a limit to interest expenses if a resident company is foreign controlled. No loss reserve for banks and the reserves of insurance companies, losses other than no losses such as those occasioned by fire or other casualty theft, etc. Miscellaneous direct expenses such as legal advertising and buying, consideration of the acquisition of inventory, losses on the disposition of capital assets. Again, uh, with that, as I said, if you incur a gain, that's in, included in the gross revenue, if you incur a loss uh, when disposing of a capital asset, uh, you'll be allowed a deduction. As I said, the calculation of the disposal of capital assets is the price sold uh, less the net book value of the asset. The net book value of the asset, of the asset sold, uh, is subjected to depreciation rules. I, I will discuss this in the later slides. Depreciation rule, again, is also a, uh, it's also deductible, however, there will be rules to that. Other than non-losses occasioned by fire or other casualty, death, other casualty, could that be damages from time food? Yeah. So, again, uh, the question from uh, the table up front is whether losses other than no losses, uh, such as those occasioned by fire or other casualty death, whether losses from Typhoons would be deductible. Yes, they would be deductible. If you lost uh, uh, inventory for from typhoons, or yeah, you can be allowed a deduction for that. On the other side of that, if they claim insurance, I'm sorry, what? So if we have a fire, we lose assets, we can write those off or whatever it might be, or inventory. If we claim it off the cost of insurance policy, is that declared as income? Insurance. Uh, theoretically, I would believe I would need was uh, those uh, will remain as deductible. However, I should actually get uh, check check uh, whether that would be deductible before giving you a wrong answer and having to correct that. I would just, I would just comment on that, uh, because if, if you consider the insurance uh, claim as an income, then you know your insurance premium is going to go up every time you claim. Uh, so you might as well declare it as a loss. Because the typhoon damage is not going to be a huge overall fire that damages the building, right? But every time you claim for insurance, they raise the premium. 
Yeah, I, I will uh, verify that uh, scenario and uh, get the uh, accurate answer. I don't want to provide a wrong answer and then have to correct it later. Any other questions? So moving on to the consideration consideration of the acquisition of uh, inventory. The basic formula is beginning inventory plus purchases minus closing inventory. Um, in this uh, particular item, we ask taxpayers, or it's your responsibility as taxpayers to monitor and track inventory. And it, this is really important in determining beginning and ending values and that will uh, determine the deduction that you will be allowed for. The costing method that is allowable is absorption costing. If they are not readily identifiable, you can use first in, first out, or FIFO, or weighted average. And then the director can require taxpayer to provide a stock take uh, on inventory in hand and take actions to verify the information provided. I will go over some examples in the following slides, so please bear with me. So, example of the uh, acquisition of inventory. Let's say, at the beginning of the year, we had 50 cases, or this really applies to a retail or wholesale uh, business. Let's say, at the beginning of the year, we had a beginning inventory of 50 cases of bottled water. They, uh, the cost of these specific part of 50 cases of bottled water were $15 for each case. During the year, let's say the retailer purchased 80 uh, cases of bottled water, and let's say the prices uh, for bottled water rose up could be for many reasons, including actually being excised the next year. And then closing inventory at the end of the year, you determine that you have 40 cases of bottled water left. How many cases of bottled water did the taxpayer presumably sell in the year? Yes, 90 cases of bottled water, that is 50 cases uh, plus 80 cases, and then minus the closing inventory of 40 cases of bottled water. So if you can identify, if the inventory is identifiable, is typically identifiable, then you can uh, re record accordingly to what was used. So for example, if of the, of the 90 cases sold, 30 cases out of the 50 beginning inventory were used, and then you move on to the 60 cases uh, from the purchases, 60 out of the 80 uh, purchases. And then the costing method uh, would uh, yield you a deduction of 1,650. This uh, calculation in there. However, what if they are not distinctively identified? Meaning that, let's say, store bottled water in a stock room, you don't want to really track which costed you $15, then which will uh, cost you $20. And you can use uh, first in, first out of five home, and that is of the 90 cases sold, we'll assume that you sold the first 50, and then you, the remaining 40 would be from the purchases. You can also use the weighted average, and then the calculation for that is, you take the 50 uh, beginning inventory cases, and the price for those uh, specific inventory plus 80 cases of bottled water, which were the purchases, multiply that to the price of those purchases. Uh, then you take that amount, uh, divide it with the number of cases that is readily, readily to be sold, and that is more 30. How you actually get 130 is the 50 plus 80. And you get a weighted average price of 18.0769 uh, 
dollars per case. You can take that uh, price per case times the 90 case of, cases of water bottle that you sold during the year, and then you get that deduction of 1626.92. Again, um, please feel free to use whatever that is convenient in your case. This is only uh, allowable and provided so that some taxpayer can maximize their deduction. Uh, depreciation. So the depreciation set forth uh, under our PPL 11 S 11 section 1002 specifies that depreciation of depreciable assets must adhere to U.S. GAAP. However, like many countries, the tax office has decided to set forth the regulation, the BPT regulations uh, 202 that identifies the following depreciation schedule. If you've been to the previous workshops, I've presented on this issue. Uh, so for motor vehicles, buses, and mini buses with a seat capacity of less than 30 passengers, goods, vehicles with a load capacity of less than 7 tons, computers, computer equipment, data hand handling equipment, and software, construction, and air moving equipment, the straight line rate is 25%. And actually, before I move on, these rates must be applied retroactively to the date where the assets were purchased. So for the class one example, if you buy a motor vehicle um, on January 1st, 2019 or earlier, that vehicle will have a net book value of zero coming January 1st, 2023. And for a bus, for buses with a seat capacity of 30 or more passengers, goods, vehicles designed to, to carry or pull loads of seven or more tons, specialized trucks, tractors, trailer, and joint mounted containers, and plant and machinery used in manufacturing, mining, forestry, or farming operation, the straight line rate is about 20%. For vessels, barges, tanks, and silver wire transportation equipment, aircraft, office furniture, fixtures, and equipment, and any additional assets not included in another class, a straight line rate is 12.5%. For buildings and other structural improvements to land, the straight line, the straight line rate is 5%. Uh, for intangible assets, for preliminary expenditures, it's 25%. 10 per, uh, for the lease of land, it's allocated over the useful life. Other intangible asset, other than preliminary expenditures or the lease of land, with a useful life of more than 10 years, it's 10%. Any other intangible assets, again, allocated over a useful life. Uh, it is important to note that if you have a building or structural improvements to land uh, on top of uh, a leased land, you must separate both before actually uh, depreciating, as uh, both uh, components they have different depreciation rates. That will also help uh, you and the tax office determine the net book value of the lease, for example, if you sell the lease. I've, in the previous workshop, we've received um, a lot of comments uh, regarding this uh, uh, discussion. If you can bear with me with the, after the examples, I'll present the proposal that we've made to the our management team and hopefully again like the PGSD if it gets approved then we'll go with that proposal but hopefully we can go over some examples before I get to the proposal. So an example is assuming that taxpayer A bought a company vehicle on January 1st of 2020 the taxpayer uses a calendar year as its tax year meaning that its financial accounts uh, every year ends on December 31st taxpayer can uh, deduct uh, $5,000 uh, as depreciation for each year. And again, you must retroactively apply the rates back to when you acquire the asset. So when January 1st of 2023 comes, and then the value of <coughs> this particular uh, model vehicle would be only 
would be five thousand dollars only, and then you be allowed that depreciation expense moving on to 2024 and onwards, and then the value has reached zero. A more realistic example is if a taxpayer bought a vehicle, company vehicle on June 15th of 2020, again using calendar year as its tax year. So in 2020, the taxpayer presumably is able to get a deduction of only $2,726. How you actually get that is the 199 uh, days from June 15th to December 31st. Take that, divide that uh, number by the 365 days a year. Take that ratio times 25%, which is the straight line rate for moral vehicles, and get times, multiply that to the acquisition cost. And then you get that. Depreciate, and I want depreciation expense of 2726. So in January 1st of 2023, the beginning book value would be 7274. Because you, you would be using the vehicle for the full year, you get a full 5000 deduction. However, in 2024, the beginning balance has been reduced to 2274, which is larger than the depreciation, the allowable depreciation expense. So you just deduct that, that, and then 2025 onwards, and then book value is zero. <coughs> so again, because we've, we've received multiple complaints from taxpayers uh, regarding depreciation, some of which included uh, uh, our own state own enterprises, uh, we've uh, made a proposal to change the depreciation discussion. So in the proposal, the taxpayer can elect a lower depreciation rate for, the depreci for their depreciable assets. However, the election, the election of the rate would be irrevocable. And therefore, taxpayer cannot elect a larger depreciation rate after making that election. So again, the rate must be in adherence with U.S. GAAP. And currently, U.S. GAAP lets taxpayers to be pretty subjective and really uses the wording of it must be reasonable and fair. Uh, so again, in the example for a motor vehicle, in the uh, depreciation uh, schedule set for under BPT regulations 202, the rate was 25%. The life of that would be just 4%. Again, deduction would be 5%. However, if you are able to elect a new rate, and let's say you elect 12.5%, the motor vehicle would have an extended life of eight years. And then the deduction would be reduced to 2,500. So then let's say you elect 12.5%. Uh, uh, use that rate, you must still retroactively apply that. However, that lower, that lower the deduction amount will still remain. So if, let's say in 2023 or 2024, you had a good year, had a significant gross revenue, you, you cannot elect to claim a larger expense or depreciation because you've elected to use 12.5% depreciation rate for the vehicles. This is, again, we need to avoid taxpayers from really manip manipulating depreciation rates. So if you had a really bad year, you wanted a lower rate to hide your losses. And then let's say you had a good year, you wanted more deductions, you make for a bigger rate. It's the tax office with this concept will be still So again, please make your elections if you want your assets to have different uh, election rates, I mean the depreciation rates. But uh, again, it will be irrevocable if you if you choose 1.5%, you 
cannot change it coming January 1st, 2024, moving onwards. So does this apply to state-owned assets uh, because it's taxpayers' money that's buying the cars for the government? So it doesn't apply to government uh, vehicles, so, right? I believe in the PGS representation, state-owned enterprises there are required to uh, register for PGST. So they're therefore, no, therefore they're in for PPT as well. So they can also claim depreciation of their vehicle. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Moving on to the special deduction slide. First is for bad debts. Again, this is really related to your receivables that have been deemed irrecoverable. Um, so again, you'll be allowed the deductions for those receivables that you deem irrecoverable, you can deduct that, but you will need to prove that if we require more information regarding your deduction for bad debts. Again, as I stated in the gross revenue section, receivables that be taxed when they are made or when they are earned, not when they are paid. So to be fair, we will allow a deduction for a portion of those receivables that been irrecoverable. However, if you receive payments for those receivables that have been recoverable years later, you will be required to include that in your gross revenue. For that, you will receive payment. Cash donations to non-profit corporations. Uh, each HST registered person will be able to uh, deduct uh, their cash donations to non-profit corporations, but we have the 5% of gross revenue limit. I understand that currently there's been a discussion on a 10% refund. Uh, I believe it's a refund of a 10%. I mean, the limit is 10% of the taxes paid. That will still be applicable in the GRT system and for those not in a non pgst registered person. If you're in for PGSD and therefore in for PPT, that refund is, I will not continue in the equity system. It will only come in the form of a deduction, again, with that 5% of the cost of the limit. Cash donations to the government in response to emergency call issued by the government. Uh, you can deduct uh, any amount that you actually uh, donate to the government. Eligible training expenditures of Palawan citizens can deduct up to. 20% of those expenses, wages paid to skilled Palawan citizens, you can deduct an additional 100% uh, of expenses. However, in the Act, uh, skilled Palawan citizens refers to Palawan citizens with a PCC skilled labor certificate. Uh, there's no discussion if a Palawan citizen has an associate degree from PCC or actually ventured out in that education elsewhere. There's no discussion on that. Uh, I think really defined skill uh, as we must have that PCC skill labor certificate. So I have a few questions. So to the uh, cast donations, we still have a limit of what? I can understand that if you, uh, in response to emergency, it's unlimited, but as you well know, we uh, donate a lot to the uh, customs, funerals, everything that goes on in the community. And so if we actually buy things as donations, can we get those expenses deducted as cash donations? Instead of giving money, should we just like buy supplies so then we would be able to get them deducted? So for uh, customs, uh, we put on customs, uh, Concept. Uh, I believe they're not a non-profit uh, corporation. I actually specify that cash donations to these non-profit corporations of the government, mm -hmm. which explicitly stated what I presented in this slide. Further definition of what uh, or the expansion of that to include customs, I cannot really comment on that. Okay. 
Well, you can give it to Red Cross, and then Red Cross goes and give it. So then the business can get a tax deduction. I mean, even foreigners now, they sometimes contribute to funerals and such. You think in the next year, hopefully, uh, we have rules for non-profit corporations for taxation purposes that we require to register. Uh, uh, that we be required to register with the Bureau of Revenue and Taxation for uh, again for companies or tax persons to be able to donate and then get that deduction. <coughs> and again, and again it, must, it must be cash donations. The uh, act itself will state that cash donations. Yeah. So then my other question on the wages of a level 100% for skilled Palawan citizens. Let's say I do not have for a particular uh, employment purpose a skilled Palawan citizen, so I have a foreign citizen. I, their wages are not allowable deductions? Or only a certain percentage? So again, as I stated, salaries, bonuses, or compensation uh, for personal services provided by the employees, they are deductible. So all employees, for, whether foreign yes, or local? Yes, okay. service of employees. Okay. Again, this is for the BPT system. Okay. Section 1298, I believe, uh, discusses for gross revenue tax, uh, uh, persons registered for the gross revenue tax system, they'll still have that uh, limit. overseas, so you have to export the car, the exporting costs will not be factored in and they will not be deductible. And then, uh, second to the last item, a fine or penalty imposed for violation of any law or regulation. So if your employee delivers a good to a customer and gets a traffic ticket, that will not be deductible. 
another non-deductible expense relates to thin capitalization, as I stated in the deduction slide. Interest expenses are deductible. However, if you are a resident company that is foreign control, meaning that 50, more than 50% of your membership interest is held by non-residents, uh, there will be limit to interest expenses. And that will be the following. If average debt to average equity exceeds the two to one ratio, deductible interest expenses is disallowed for the following portion of total interest expenses. The formula used is A times B divided by C, where A is the total interest expenditure, B is the debt in excess of the two to one average debt to average equity ratio, and C is the average debt for the year. The purpose of this is to avoid the debt shifting from outside the public to the public. So, say uh, the, the foreign company who controls the resident company uh, realizes that Cloud is implementing a new tax system, interest will be deductible. They would most likely have, or they would most likely, or they would attempt to pressure that resident company to uh, borrowing capital for them, and then they enjoy that uh, interest uh, expenses deduction. So again, this uh, discussion really this allows uh, that activity from uh, happening. Another non-deductible expense is. If a taxpayer is allowed a deduction for payment for which the taxpayer is, with, is required to withhold tax, the deduction is not allowed until the tax year in which the withholding tax has been paid to the director. Examples of application of this uh, non deductible expense can be related to wages and salaries or the non resident tax. A more technical, technical example is if you are required to withhold tax or if you are required to withhold $1,000 from your employees' gross salaries as salaries and wages tax, but you fail to re remit uh, that $1,000 to the government, you, you would be disallowed from deducting your employees' gross salaries until the year on which you remit that tax to the government. We want to the administration of the business profits tax. So key concepts to understand is BPT is paid in advance uh, by installment that must be paid by the 15th day of each month following the end of the third, sixth, ninth, and twelve months of the taxpayer's tax year. For most of uh, for most taxpayers, uh, at least from the workshops, uh, your tax year would be similar to the calendar year, meaning your financial accounts uh, end on December 31st. However, if you have a different tax, uh, different tax year, the concept will still apply. Hopefully, I will go over timeline examples that will uh, provide a better picture of what uh, is to be expected. The amount of installment is 25% times variable A, where A is the BPT liability from the prior tax year. If there was no tax liability from the prior year, 2% of quarterly gross revenue will be used. Uh, this will also be applicable in the com commencement year next year, as we are unable to calculate the uh, year 2022's BPT liability. And then as I move over the penalty slide, you as the taxpayer, you have the right to uh, apply for a variation from that 2%. However, you will bear the risk of underestimating your BPT and then will be penalized after. The annual return for a tax year must be filed within three months after the tax year. I will provide a timeline examples for this, so hopefully uh, there will be more uh, you guys could actually get the concept of it. So the general time example is, if you are a calendar year taxpayer, the installments would be due on April 15, July 15, October 15 of year one, as well as January 15 of year two. Your BPT return for year one will be due 
uh, by March 31st of year two. When you, fi when you file your BPT return for year one, we'll be able to determine if you overpaid or underpaid. I mean, overestimated or underestimated your BPT. We'll compare in that, when you file your BPT return, we'll have the gross revenue, expense, uh, your net taxable income, set aside by 12%. We we'll compare that to the total amount that you paid in installments. If you overpay, uh, we'll refund the, the amount for the difference. If you underpay, uh, we'll give you a bill uh, to pay. So, for 2023, again, as I stated, we cannot calculate your 2022's BPT liability because we, so we are still in the GRT system. So, on the set dates, 2% of your quarterly gross revenue will be due. So, for example, the April 15, 2% of your first quarter, that is from January 1st to March 31st. If you gross revenue of that quarter, 2% of that will be due April 15. July 15, 2% of your second quarter, that's from April 1st to June 30th, 2% of the quarter gross revenue would be the means. Same thing applies. By uh, March 31st, 2024, you will, your 2023 BPT return will be due. And then when you file your 2023 BPT return, you will be able to determine whether your actual BPT liability is uh, was is uh, bigger or smaller than the total that you paid by installments, and then in 2024, assuming that uh, you as the taxpayer have a net income and therefore we can calculate your BPT lab 2023's BPT liability, we'll use that 2023 BPT liability as the basis, and we get 25 percent of that. We get from the same dates, 15 days after the end of each quarter. And then when you file for March 31st, when you file for your 2024 BPT return, by March 31st, 2025, you'll be able to determine if you underestimated or overestimated your actual 2024 BPT return. Any questions? So, right around this, Timeline March 31st, 2024, 2023's PPT return will be due, and then beginning April 15, we collect 25% of that. Then a timeline example for a non calendar year taxpayer, the same thing still applies. 15 days after each quarter, installments are due. Three months after the tax year uh, end, your BPT return will be due. Penalties for underestimating business profits tax. Again, as I stated, you as the taxpayer can apply for a variation of the installments. In other words, you can apply to reduce that 2% gross revenue measure. However, if a tax shortfall occurs, it's you, uh, the taxpayer is penalized and assessed 10% of the tax shortfall amount. Tax shortfall is the event where actual business profits tax payable. So the tax year is 20% more than amounts paid in installments for tax year. <coughs> no question before I move to other notes. So if you're under BPT, you uh, pay the 2% of your gross as an installment each quarter and then at the end of the year that's when you file the return that's when you uh, put in all of your deductibles right so the two percent gross revenue only applies if there's no uh, there was no tax liability from the prior year right. so if you had a net loss the next year you will use two percent as i said this will also be applicable next year as we cannot calculate your 2022 ppt liability you're still in the GRT system. But if you have a net income and a net loss, the basis to measure BPT for the following year will be 25% of that value. What we can do as a sole So let's say you're a sole proprietor and you own more than one business unit. Do you have to do for each company? No, sir. 
you know, so the question was if you are a sole trader with multiple companies or multiple business license, no. In this case, you, you will only find file one BPT return. You aggregate all amounts for all the license. Yeah, all the license. Ah, okay. Okay. All license, the amounts for all license, you aggregate in one return. So moving on to other notes, if you attended the previous workshops, we've indicated that we've, we're still working on the BPT forms. Uh, however, finally, we are able to present the draft versions of the BPT forms. This is only the calculation uh, sheet. And again, it, again, as we emphasize that it is still in uh, it's still considered as draft. It is not the final. We will still do, we have to we consider with other stakeholders on the best way to really have uh, have the beauty forms. But something something like this is what you can you as the taxpayers can expect. And because we've allowed multiple uh, discussions such as uh, changing the depreciation rates, there may be more information that will be need that will be needed as different schedules. For example, the depreciation schedule that we actually use for all your depreciation assets, we will most likely have require that to be attached to the form so that we can verify what is presented in this form. A call to action, again, as I believe as uh, it was discussed in the BGSP presentation, this new tax system will really for a more robust uh, record keeping process. BGSP is accounted for in cash basis, and by default, BPT is accounted for in uh, accrual basis. So as you probably can infer, it's more ro robust record keeping process is really needed to if you are in for PGSD and for BPT. And then before I uh, end my presentation, hopefully I will provide one example, more technical example. I believe you should have uh, received the scratch paper. Hopefully we can work on this for maybe five minutes. Provide the answer then we'll end the PPT presentation. You can really aggregate your items to gross revenue and then the deductions, the net taxable income times that 12% and your PPT level.
Okay, I have 1,824. Twenty-seven thousand two hundred. That's one. So one thousand eight hundred twenty-four. Twenty-seven thousand two hundred. That's the second answer that we received. Any answers over here? One eight two four. So that's another one for a thousand eight two four. That's your so table. Huh? One eight two four. One eight two four. Objections? Uh, are we in agreement with one eight to four? Or what the still one? You have an answer. Two one six zero. Any the answers from this table? No, this is not a test. Though. Three two six four. And the answer from this table. No? Okay. Any I have answer only. Any answers from this table? One eight two four. Consensus that uh, those are the proposed answers. Proposed yes. <laughs> yes. So that we can see that this. One eight two four. How you actually get? It? Yeah, I got the uh, 1824 BPT liability. It's uh, your gross revenue from uh, for 2023. Again, it was 412. That also is, that also includes the 12,000 accrued revenue. You fulfilled orders on December 31st. Although you have not received payment, that will be taxed in 2023. The salaries and wages, there was 800 incurred for, uh, in fulfilling that December 31st order. That would be included as, as expenses. As you incur that expense, it's not a matter when you pay that expense. Similar to the cost of inventory, as well as the utilities, it's not a matter when you actually pay uh, expenses, it is when you incur those expenses. <clears throat> so, if Best Wholesaler was in the, the GRT system, Best Wholesaler would have paid 16000 Dollars in taxes, and that's a 400,000 gross revenue times 4%. 400,000 gross revenue GRT does not include the 12,000 that was uh, earned but was not paid in 2023. In BPT, best wholesaler uh, would have to be paid 8,240, that is 2% of total gross revenue in installments throughout the year. That is refunded 6,416. That is the total amount of installments 8,240 less uh, actual BPT payable of 1824. So it can be said that the uh, best wholesaler had a net total savings of 14,176 in taxes by moving to BPT. Use my presentation. Thank you so much. Brief announcement regarding PGST invoices. So 
there has been indication that has been made uh, that there will be changes to the PGSD invoice requirements. We're looking into uh, just removing it, then we can issue the same invoice to everyone. But uh, we will formally, uh, I'll, I'll, we're formally announcing it that it, that's the direction that we've been given. And then a formal written uh, written communication will be made uh, will be made uh, soon with regards to the invoice. So please bear with us. We will have that as soon out as soon as possible. Um, I think all the other taxes are pretty much uh, clear. We'll just go through them really fast. One being the hotel room and vessel cabin occupancy tax was decreased from twelve dollars to or twelve percent to ten dollars or ten percent. That was lower. The as we've stated before, it's the there is now a three tier system to the wages and salary tax. So we moved from just the first eight thousand being taxed at six percent and anything above eight thousand being taxed at twelve percent to a three tier system where there's a six percent, a ten percent and a twelve percent. And this we've discussed this um, beforehand. Carbon tax, as we've mentioned, the current rate at the moment is five cents per gallon. The new rate come January 1st will be two cents per gallon. Uh, non-resident tax is in, imposed uh, on a non-resident person who derives interest royalty or insurance premium in Palau. Non-resident in the sense where it's a business, not a, not a foreign any questions on non-resident tax? So if you pay royalties to a uh, if you pay royalties to a non-resident company, then you have to withhold um, ten percent uh, from the royalty payment that you make to them. And that's uh, you will remit that on an approved form. Yes. So uh, shareholder dividends. So the company's already paid twelve percent. Sorry, shareholder dividends. The company's paid twelve percent tax on the profit. Right. And then we release dividends. Is that considered taxable under this, or is that? Uh, yeah. Do we just confirm exempt thing? Uh, international transportation tax, it's a 4% tax imposed on the gross revenue derived by a non-resident uh, for the carriage of passengers, livestock, mail, merchandise, or goods embarked or loaded in the Republic and destined for a place outside of Palau. This is really for the charter flights uh, that come in that are not incorporated here in Palau. They'll have to pay four percent tax on the revenue that they make on the trip. And ships, flights and ships. A land transaction uh, proceeds fee is a 4% uh, fee that will be imposed on the proceeds of any lease or transfer of land for any purpose or business profits tax or GRT do not apply. And this does not apply to leases made by uh, the Palau Public Lands Authority or State Public Lands Authority to a Palau citizen or a wholly Palauan owned business entity. I think we've discussed this uh, in our 
previous workshops. There are social assistance payments available for Palawan citizens uh, who are engaged who engage in the informal market sector. And there are and there are as follows and. Mm. It's for those with a gross revenue of 15,000 or less that's specific to their actual uh, market revenue. And they can uh, receive up to 600 or 4% of their market revenue back. Uh, <clears throat> for Palau citizens who receive, who receive social security benefits, uh, as well as uh, benefits from the civil service pension plan with uh, total market revenue combined with a retirement income less than $15,000 a year. You are also given a social, eligible for a social assistance payment of 4% of your market revenue up to a maximum of $600. So I think one thing that this presentation doesn't capture is what happens if your if your gross revenue is fifty thousand to three hundred thousand. What is there for you, and you're not uh, an FIAC. Uh, for businesses with a gross revenue of fifty thousand to three hundred thousand, you have the option to register for PGST. Or you can remain under gross revenue tax. That's on you to decide. And when you submit your application for PGSD, there are certain requirements that we look into before we register you. For those with the for those with a gross revenue below fifty thousand, you'll only pay a hundred dollars a year in addition to the business license. Uh, of $50. But that $100 is to be paid in quarterly installments. So $25 per quarter. Any questions? So if you missed my announcement before, um, we've received indications that we're going to make um, forward with changes to the PGSD invoice to make it as easy for our taxpayers to transition. Therefore, the <clears throat> what's gonna happen is that they'll be able to issue the uh, invoice to anyone. It'll be just one general template. Uh, and uh, for, I think, I believe what we've uh, decided and uh, we'll communicate it to you in a written format uh, by email is that uh, if it's uh, supplies over a thousand, we'll simply just ask for the name and address of at least the uh, recipient. Uh, but the movement has been made that uh, uh, th there will be no separate PGSD invoice. It can be just one invoice, not a but invoice, not a receipt. Yeah, so the invoice is still there. Yeah. So would it be advisable for those who earn between fifty and three hundred thousand? If they're still allowed to have allowable deductions, should they just register and be PGST registered? Would that make it easier for everybody? Yeah, yes, 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 but that is uh, really on them to decide. So you weigh out the, you weigh it out, the, you look at cost benefit, the cost and the benefit to registry, and then um, make the decision to register. If, I think, I believe this would be, the end of our presentation. My only last uh, uh, if you haven't registered the, for the tourism recovery and business opportunity session for tomorrow, 
Those are one of the side events of the economic symposium this whole week. Um, we'll send you a registration link to sign up for the event. Uh, you are free to join us. Please, if you're interested, register as soon as possible so we can ensure your spot for tomorrow's session. And please be reminded that the economic symposium will take place on Thursday, November 17th at the Maramayong Cultural Center. So please, uh, please join us then. And uh, I think this is it for the tax reform workshop. If you've also signed up for the next session, you're welcome to stay. Thank you for joining us this morning, and we look forward to working with you in um, ensuring that you meet uh, your tax obligations. And please continue to raise critical issues like you've done thus far. It really does help um, push um, changes and amendments to be made. Thank you.